Hey folks, this video is something of a companion video to the laser lithography project. So if you haven't seen that video and you don't know what this thing is, I'd recommend watching that first just to get an overview of like what's going on here. This video is specifically about the different 3D printed components and what works and what doesn't work. And I learned a lot of things throughout the course of this project and went through a lot of iterations to get to this point and had some knowledge I wanted to share about like what is a good 3D printed optomechanical part and what's not. So this video is probably not for a lot of people. Feel free to click away if this isn't your jam, but if you're building something like this or interested in making optical holders and bases and components with a 3D printer, this might be interesting to you. Now this probably seems obvious, but it took me a while to learn this point. But I think the most important part of building an optical system, especially at home, is to have a good and flexible base. So I use this old fixture plate. It has a variety of tapped holes so that you can screw different things in different locations. And it works great as an optical breadboard. But in the past, I've also used aluminum extrusion as a single dimensional base or a cube system like UC2, where different components can just kind of magnetize in place, kind of like Lego blocks. And I'll show some more UC2 stuff in a bit. You can directly contrast that to the 3D printed base that I made for the LaserCon Focal project. That was designed up in CAD so that all the different components were in basically the right position with a little bit of adjustment so that everything would snap into place and be ready to go, in theory. But in reality, I printed that thing like a dozen different times, like tweaked and tuned different parts of the system or decided I didn't like different lens configurations. And it was a huge waste of time and resources and ultimately not very flexible. So there's a reason that Optics Lab use breadboards like this and it's because it makes your life a lot easier to rearrange and change things and really just kind of play with stuff. So that's not really 3D printed related, but it took me a while to really appreciate the flexibility of an optical breadboard system. Let's start by talking about kinematic mounts. So there are two mounts here that you can see. This one is obviously the commercial product from Thor Labs, made out of metal, has nice everything, good finish, adjusts easily, really pleasant to work with. And then we have the 3D printed version. And the point of these kinematic mounts is to provide tip and tilt so that you can align your mirrors correctly. And it's done by changing these adjustment screws. You can see they're very finely threaded, so each turn of the screw moves the mirror just a little bit in tip or tilt. I chose to use this kinematic mount here simply because it had the dichroic that I needed. This is something I purchased off eBay from like a used lot and it happened to have a nice dichroic mirror of the right wavelength, which is why it got used in this location. But really I could have used a 3D printed mount like this one and it would have worked fine for this application. This kinematic mount you can see has three screws in the back. These are M3 screws that go through heat set inserts in the 3D print. There's a window back here and then the mirror itself goes into basically just a little box that has a lip on it to hold the beam splitter in place. So this is just a press fit. It's just stuck in there. There's no glue or adhesive. And these magnets on the back are just little spherical ball magnets that are also press fit in there. And those attach to the fronts of the M3 screws just by magnet force alone. And you can adjust tip and tilt by changing these individual screws. So functionally, it's the same as this kinematic mount, just 3D printed. So if I didn't have this nice commercial Thor Labs. I wouldn't have had any problem using this. This would have gotten the job done perfectly. Obviously the dimensions would have been different. I would have had to print a custom holder for a mirror of this size, but that's just details. The biggest downside to this 3D printed layout is you can see the plate has some shift to it, right? It just kind of sticks on the, the screws. So it can wobble around and it's not always centered perfectly. That's okay when you're dealing with a mirror like this because the beam is going to be tiny in the middle of the mirror. So you just need to hit the center of the mirror somewhere and then adjust tip and tilt. The exact alignment of this mirror doesn't really matter. So a 3D printed kinematic mount like this is perfect. In contrast, there's a kinematic mount back here for the red laser diode, which is very problematic. And let me zoom in on that. 
So you can see in the back of this device, there are three magnets that are press fit into these countersinks and the red laser diode has a similar arrangement. There's heat set inserts with M3 screws that go through it to provide the tip and tilt mechanism. And that sits like that. This is a bad arrangement. So this is something that really didn't work very well. It does give you tip and tilt by adjusting the tripod, but you'll see that the lateral shift here is much more problematic. The diode can sit pretty much anywhere touching those magnets and it will stay put. But that means every time you adjust any of these legs, the laser spot will move in X or Y, not just tip and tilt. And this is problematic for this because it needs to remain precisely kind of collinear with its axis to line up with everything else. If you look underneath the kinematic mounts, you'll see 3D printed bases and posts that go inside the bases. You can buy metal posts and bases, and honestly, they're not even that expensive, and they would probably provide a little bit more rigid support, but these also work really well. I haven't really had problems with them. The main goal of the base and the post is to anchor it to whatever your breadboard of choice is, and then provide you with a little bit of kind of axial displacement, adjusting it up and down. So that's accomplished. Again, we've got a heat set insert with an M4 bolt that goes in and holds a 3D, uh, a 3D printed base in place, and it just is a friction fit and puts it at roughly the right location. A nice thing about 3D printing is it's really easy to customize these. So rather than this one sitting directly above the base, the post that's printed is offset. And that's just convenient because it puts the center of rotation of the mirror in the middle of the post so that you can adjust things easier. And that's super simple to do in a 3D print and you don't have to go out and buy a specific offset base. You can do other customizations like this base incorporates a sliding fit so that it can have a little bit of adjustment in the X position or a little bit of rotation. And this is just convenient where you might not quite know the position that everything should be and want a little bit of flexibility, but you don't need micrometer precision off an actual linear stage. Stability wise, I've not really had any problems with these. They don't really seem to move around much. They're pretty easy to use. I only really use them in places that can tolerate pretty coarse alignment. So for example, this lens didn't particularly matter if it was exactly on axis or slightly above or below. And so it could tolerate a little bit of misalignment and this was a perfect application. Similarly, the mirrors didn't really care if they were too high or too low. The beam just had to hit the mirror at some point. So that's a great application of these 3D printed posts and bases. If we look at the back section, you can see that it's a little bit different. The laser diode and collimating lens both have mechanical stages to precisely tune the alignment. Trying to hit a 20 micron pinhole with a laser diode is challenging to do with a 3D print. And it's, it's doable, but it's not a fun time. So it's much easier just to use a relatively cheap set of stages to get the alignment that you need. You'll notice that the pinhole actually has no adjustment at all. It is just a holder for the pinhole set directly onto a base and post. I had read somewhere online that it's a lot easier to adjust the laser to the pinhole rather than the pinhole to the laser, because when you move this around but keep everything after it in alignment, you don't need to tweak anything downstream when you change the pinhole laser alignment. But if you move the pinhole, then everything else shifts in any particular direction. So this proved to be a pretty easy and robust way to quickly tweak the pinhole alignment without touching anything else. As far as lens holding arrangements, you can see two different styles here. The first one is kind of an open top design where the element fits down into a little groove. And the second one is an enclosed design where there's a lip on the front that keeps the lens from falling out and then you just press fit it in the back. They both have their pros and cons. The open top design is convenient if you have multiple lenses that need to get stacked in close proximity. The downside is that the curvature of the lens on the front can make it a little difficult to size the groove correctly because strongly curved elements will butt up against that groove. And sometimes it's hard to get precise axial alignment between multiple elements when you do it in this style. But it is quick and easy to pop things in and out. 
This back design is probably easier to print because you can print in this direction and get really good dimensional tolerance on the circle to hold the lens in place. But it's a little less convenient because you have to push it in the back and you can't stack as many elements kind of next to each other. And if you don't get the tolerance just right, the lens can fall out, which is not great. On the side here are the two holding brackets for the kinematic mounts. And as I mentioned in the original video, this is just a really bad setup. I regret this heavily. <laughs> it caused a lot of problems. Predominantly, the extrusion that they're mounted to is over here, but the load, the kinematic mirrors need to be offset a little bit. And the nature of the beam path means it needs to be open over here where the extrusion is. So everything's kind of hung off at an angle. It's cantilevered. There's not a lot of plastic supporting everything here. And it's just a, a not a great design. So this top one in particular is pretty wobbly. So any adjustment of these kinematic screw mounts on the top tend to make the whole thing wobble around and makes it a lot more difficult to align than it should be. The bottom one is a little better just because the design is a little stiffer, but again, not great. And furthermore, they're attached just with T-nuts into the extrusion, and these T-nuts can slip over time and slowly settle. So this is really a pretty bad design that goes out of alignment frequently. Coming around to the scan and tube lens configurations, you can see that it's basically a lens that's housed inside of a full enclosure with a lip to keep the lens in place, and then just some support brackets down to this assembly which slides onto the aluminum extrusion. And that gives me, if I wanted, a little bit of travel so that I can adjust the fine distance of this mirror or this lens to the mirrors in the Galvo. It's obviously very crude. You can't do this in very small increments. But for this type of arrangement, it was sufficient to get everything relatively well aligned. I liked this arrangement. This worked out really well. The major disadvantage is that it relies on the parallelism of the aluminum extrusions to the Galvo. And so the Galvo is mounted with T-nuts to the extrusions. And if there's any misalignment, that comes through the lenses and there's nothing you can do about it because these lenses have no adjustment. So that's a minor weakness, but you can fiddle with it by adjusting the Galvo itself and how it's mounted. Otherwise, it's nice because it's very rigid, it doesn't move around, it's collinear, it's right where it needs to be as long as you measure everything correctly and print it well. And finally, we get to this front section, which is kind of a study in not knowing the exact dimensions that are needed, so adding in a ton of adjustments <laughs> so that I could figure it out once I was assembling. I knew roughly the dimensions that items needed to be placed at, you know, this had to be 150 millimeters from that. And then the focal distance of this is 100 millimeters. So from here down to the substrate, that path is 100 millimeters. But I wasn't quite sure where the back focal plane of the microscope objective was. And so there is a lot of uncertainty here, which I baked into this design. So you can see that pretty much everything here is adjustable. The top section has these two M4 screws that allows it to slide. So this part can slide in and out as required to adjust the distance. And then similarly, this one down here can slide and adjust as well. And they're tightened in place with the screws on the side. And there's a little bit of lithium grease just to make it a, a little more slidey. I learned my lessons from the side kinematic mounts, and this is much more robust. This is actually a pretty thick piece of PLA. It has a nice curve in it to give it some strength. And this is generally pretty rigid compared to the other ones. I'm sure there's sag and creep here too, so this is not ideal. You should really have these supported directly so the center of mass is going down on the plastic rather than cantilevered, but it worked out okay. And as it turns out, I needed most of the adjustment range. I think I had it set out to about here when I actually ran my tests. We can see another example of bad kinematic design with this microscope objective. I thought it would need a little tip and tilt adjustment. As it turns out, we really didn't. But this system is a lot like the laser diode kinematic mount in the back where the microscope objective has three screws that sit on three different magnets and that allows you to adjust it as a tripod. And it suffers the same problems as the laser diode in that it can sit happily in a few different locations on the magnets because it's not constrained, 
in any particular way other than the magnet force holding it down. And the magnets are content to hold it in a few different orientations. So this thing can kind of slide around more than I'm comfortable with. It's not ultimately that big of a problem because it's the last element. So you can just adjust it as need be. Whereas the laser diode was really finicky and basically impossible to get positioned correctly. This wasn't so bad. But this is again an example of not a great use of 3D printed adjustments. And then finally, if we pan down, <laughs> you can see that this XYZ stage is sitting on this very flimsy uh, L bracket, I guess. This is bad. <laughs> you can see how much that vibrates. A lot of folks mentioned in the comments that maybe vibration of this device was leading to some of the performance problems I saw with like the wobbly lines or the lines being bigger than they should. And that's definitely a possibility considering how much this wobbles. So this, there's no excuse for it. It needs to be reprinted as something chunkier. I was just getting lazy at this point in the project and didn't feel like it. I mentioned UC2 a little earlier. I'll put a link up so folks can find it. I recommend UC2 for anyone that wants to get started on building DIY optical components and configurations, but are a little intimidated by kind of a fully custom setup like this with custom 3D parts and extrusions everywhere. UC2 uses a printable cube system effectively to make it a lot easier to get up and running. And they have a lot of really cool examples as well. So the system, is based on a cubic breadboard structure that has press fit magnets in the corners. And then you make little individual cubes that hold optical elements and they just magnetize onto this grid. So this acts as the breadboard for you. And then all of the cube structures hold different things that are placed at specific distances from each other. And everything's kind of standardized and there's lots of designs in the repository for say lens holders or mirror holders, or you can always design your own. This was something I made custom myself or get really complicated. Here's a three dimensional three degree of freedom flexure that I made. And here's a different kind of flexure that I made. So there's a lot of flexibility in the system and it's actually how I prototyped the confocal laser system to start before I made you know, the custom thing that I ended up with. So this is kind of my recommendation for folks that would like to start playing with optical systems and particularly want something that is easily done at home with a 3D printer. As a final passing note, I will say that there are quite a few commercial components like these kinematic mounts on eBay for not a whole lot of money, particularly ones that are empty and don't have the element inside them. So mixing and matching commercial and 3D printed parts in a system like this is really the best way to do it. You can use the nice stuff where required and use the 3D printed stuff where the tolerances are a little looser. Okay, well, I think that's all I got. Hopefully this was interesting to folks and you picked up some tips and tricks to do in your own projects and things to avoid. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.